I'm going to have you turn with me back this morning to Galatians chapter 5. Do you remember what's in Galatians chapter 5? I'm going to grab my water while you're thinking. Galatians chapter 5 is one of those landmark passages of scripture that should be almost as familiar to you as John 3.16 or the 23rd Psalm. Or another one that we read this morning from Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. What is so important from out of Galatians chapter 5 that I would say that is kind of a landmark passage of scripture? <clears throat> <coughs> Becky knows. <laughs> what, what did somebody else say? What are verses 22 and 23 about? The fruit of the Spirit. I've been on this, this kick all year long. We're over halfway through now. Of, of lifting up Jesus Christ. I believe that if we lift up Jesus, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And I believe that he was speaking about his crucifixion. But I believe that there's application there that if we will lift up Jesus Christ, what does it mean to lift up Jesus Christ? Praise Jesus Christ. Exalt him. Raise him up. Look up to him. Worship him. Should we worship Jesus? Absolutely. Because there's coming a day, the Apostle Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 2, there's coming a day that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth. And every tongue will confess the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's not wrong to worship Jesus. In fact, you can read over in, in Revelation chapter 5. Uh, chapter 4 of Revelation is when John is actually transported up to heaven. And he's given a vision of what things look like up in heaven. He sees God on the throne. He sees the four beasts. He sees the 24 elders around the throne. He also sees that there is a scroll that nobody can open, and it's sealed with seven seals. And when it's found out that nobody can open it, John starts weeping. And um, then all of a sudden, the voice says, hey, but wait, good news. There is somebody that is worthy to un unopen the seals. And, of course, that is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And it says that when... That is announced that they're singing up in heaven. Praise to God for Jesus Christ, this lamb that was slain. And it says the praise starts around the throne with the four beasts. It starts with the 24 elders. Then it moves to all of the angelic beings. It says that there's like over 100 million angels that start singing praises to the lamb. And then it ends up going to every person on that's ever been created sings praises to Jesus so it's, we need to lift up Jesus Christ, that if people see us lifting up Jesus Christ, praising Jesus Christ, they will want the Jesus that we have. Who knows, Tim? You could have some other pancreatic people that end up saying, boy, I'd like to see Jesus do that for me. Of course, you can't guarantee. But you can end up saying, I know somebody who can, and his name is Jesus. To let you folks know how serious pancreatic cancer, earlier this year, uh, one of Clyde's good friends, Tim Lawson passed away of pancreatic cancer. He was diagnosed with it just six weeks before he passed away. Six weeks time. And in fact, another piece of trivia, I'll go ahead and throw it out there. When they went to the funeral, Clyde was looking at the minister and he ends up saying, man on me, he says, said to the minister, he says, you look just like the guy on Duck Dynasty. And the guy said to him, says, yeah, I hear that a lot. Come to find out, it was one of the guys from Duck Dynasty that was good friends with Tim Lawson that actually did the funeral service. So, but I just kind of threw that out as name dropping or whatnot. I'm grateful to hear that Duck Dynasty, and by the way, that is a family with deep faith in God. And I'm grateful that there are some of these people as role models out there. Not saying that I'm going to grow the long beard. Alan doesn't have a beard. Alan doesn't have a beard. He doesn't have a beard. He's a preacher. Pre pre well, I figure, you remember what happened to Jesus whenever they went, they plucked his beard? I 
figure if I don't have one, they can't pluck mine. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, My one mode is Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow, okay. Well, um, what I was going to end up saying too, I, I don't mean to digress, please forgive me. Years ago, when I was younger, it's one of those things when you're a young man, you want to grow a beard. And so I decided that I would grow a beard. This was at Highland Avenue. And so I, I grew a beard and I went to the church and uh, I announced to the church, I said, in a continuing effort to become more like Jesus, I decided to grow a beard. And one lady sitting in the church was not impressed and she shot back at me. She says, it's always so much easier to change the outside than the inside, isn't it? <laughs> Burn. <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> At any rate, we'll get back to the message. The Apostle Paul wants us to lift up Jesus, that people might come to know Jesus, whether it's their need of a physical healing or if it's a person that's needing Jesus to forgive them of sins. We need to lift up Jesus. And I've tried to give you all, all year round reasons of why we can lift up Jesus. And I started these messages, oh, I don't know, must have been back uh, right after Easter, because when Jesus ended up going back to heaven, he, just, he said to his disciples, when I go back to heaven, I'm going to do you a big favor. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the comforter, in other words. And he's going to be with you. And there's several things that the Holy Spirit's done. And so we've looked at some of the things that we need to give thanks to Jesus because the Holy Spirit has come to do stuff for us. For instance, the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us gifts. You know, you talk about gifts of the Spirit. Sometimes we focus on speaking in tongues. We, we focus upon prophesying. We focus upon healing. We can focus on... All, but the Holy Spirit also gives the gift of encouragement. And that's one that I ended up focusing upon. That means that you and I can end up being a Barnabas. What do you mean a Barnabas? In the New Testament, Barnabas which means, his name actually means, son of encouragement. Barnabas was the guy that when the apostle Paul became a Christian, because prior to that, he had been a, a, a fanatic Jewish man and he killed Christians. Barnabas was the one that came before everybody else and said, listen, God has definitely worked in Saul's life. You can trust him. And you and I have these gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us because God wants us to lift up the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Everything that we're going to have comes from Jesus Christ. If we're going to go to heaven, it's because of Jesus. In fact, I'll, I'll go even further. Jesus is the reason for everything. If you go back and read what Paul wrote to the church at Col Col Colossae in Colossians chapter 1, it says, By Jesus all things were created and by Jesus, everything exists. And I know that some people say, well, I thought that God created everything. What does it say that God did in Genesis chapter 1? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, it does say that God created. But how did God create it? God ended up speaking these things into existence. He said, let there be light. There was light. When you speak, what do you use? Words. And that's where gospel writer John comes along and says, Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus is that spoken Word of God. And Jesus is the one that we have everything. If we're going to go to heaven, it's because of Jesus. We need to lift up the name of Jesus. Well, looking at Galatians chapter 5, when Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit, Jesus said the Holy Spirit is going to start doing some things within your life. And so this is, I think, the third week this year that I've preached from this. The Holy Spirit wants to produce fruit within our lives. Some things within our lives that are good. And I told you folks before, I like fruit. In fact, I love fruit. I've got in my refrigerator at home some cherries right now. I've got some strawberries. I've got some blueberries in my freezer. I mean, I love fruit. I think I just ran out of my grapes. But I I eat a lot of fruit, partly because it's sweet, but also because it's nutritious. 
The fruit that God gives is stuff that is sweet and it's nutritious. This is stuff that is appealing to people and it's also something that is good for people. The, the fruit of the Spirit, these are the characteristics that the Holy Spirit wants to produce within our lives. And I've already spent time on the first four. The first four are the fruit of the Spirit is love. The Holy Spirit wants to produce within us love. Love for who? Love for God and love for others. The Holy Spirit, and if you will, I, you and I will love God more and love others more. I tell you what, we need more people like that in this world. Amen? The Holy Spirit will produce love. The Holy Spirit will produce joy. You and I can find joy in living. I told you here, I think it was two weeks ago, because last week's message was 4th of July message. But I said to you two weeks ago, joy has not to do so much with happiness. Happiness is dependent upon happenstance. The things that happen to you. Joy comes from a deep inner feeling that it doesn't matter what happens, all is well. And I use the illustration of Horatio Spafford. He lost his family at sea, and yet he went back to his cabin and he wrote down the words to the song, It Is Well With My Soul. He had down inside of him a joy that no matter what happened, he knew that all is well. I could use as another illustration about a man, and I know that I've used this in the past, but about a man who uh, all of his life had been consumed by his business. That's what he lived thinking about morning, noon, and night. He just, everything was about making money and growing his business. And it was about to destroy him. Until one day somebody told him about Jesus. And the man decided, you know what? I'm tired of all of the stress and stuff I'm putting myself under. What I really need is Jesus. And the man gave his heart to Jesus. And the people thought to themselves, I wonder what kind of a difference it's going to make in the man. Shortly after the man gave his heart to Jesus, the man got a call in the middle of the night that the business that he worked so hard for was burning to the ground. And the man got out of bed and hurriedly threw some clothes on, put his shoes on, and went down to the business, and he stood outside, and people were amazed as they stood there and they looked at the man. That rather than being upset about what he had worked so hard investing his life in, that the man was completely under control and actually seemed to have a peaceful look on his face. And the people says, we don't understand. What in the world is going on? that you can end up reacting the way that you're reacting with your business burning down. And the man ended up saying, he says, this were his words. Not too long ago, I became a Christian because I realized that this business that I've worked so hard for, I didn't own it. It owned me. And he said, it was killing me. Somebody told me about Jesus. And I came to Jesus, and I gave him not only my heart, I gave him everything that I owned. You see, I don't own that business anymore. And if Jesus wants to burn down his business, what difference does that make to me? Just a nice story? No, this man understood. The Holy Spirit comes in and gives you joy. Then in spite of the hardships that you may go through, you know that it is well with your soul. The Holy Spirit gives us not only joy, but the Holy Spirit gives us peace, love, joy, peace. That in the midst of the storm, we can know that everything is under control. There isn't one thing that has happened to you that God hasn't been there ahead of you. I don't know if somebody has ever pointed this out to you before, but most of us grew up reciting together the 23rd Psalm. What's the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd. Maybe? No. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me. The key thing that I want you to focus on there 
If Jesus is leading us, there is not a single thing that we will ever come to that he has not been there ahead of us. And if he's leading, you can rest assured, he's got us in his care. And that's what the psalmist goes on to talk about. So we've got love, joy, peace. Another thing that the Holy Spirit wants to work on within our lives, you remember two weeks ago, Dorothy Schaefer was back for the first time. She had her son-in-law and her daughter with, they came back from Florida, and I picked on her son-in-law. Dave, Dave's a fellow golfer. Clyde's a golfer. Hank's a golf son of the past. And I ended up asking these guys, I says, why aren't you better golfers? And I did not pay him to say it, but Dave ended up speaking up in the back. He says, I guess I'm not a better golfer because I haven't worked hard enough at it. And some of y'all say, I could care less about golf. I use it as an illustration playing again. Some people end up thinking that I do all right. In fact, I feel like I do okay, you know, as far as playing. But I tell you what, folks, I watch people on YouTube. I see little kids. Miss Bessie, you know what? I see little kids, four and five years of age, that can play circles around me on, the, on YouTube. Here's what I want to say, though. I know we talk about people having talent. All of those little kids, when they came to the world, they didn't know how to move their fingers the way that they moved their fingers. They had, they had to work at it. And so the Holy Spirit begins to come into our life, and he ends up saying, listen, you're going to have to suffer long at things that you want to see happen. You know, there's a lot of people that end up giving up on their marriages these days. Do I really believe that marriages are so much worse today than what they were back 40, 50 years ago? I'll tell you this much. Back 40, 50 years ago, a lot of women were physically abused. A lot of women were physically abused. And there were no police to go running to. It was one of those things that silently went on in the homes of a lot of women. I see Becky shaking her head. You talk with the older generation. There were a lot of women that put up with a lot of things in their home. The women today. And I'm not saying that it's right. I'm just telling you that in the older days, People ended up saying, guess what? Marriage ain't perfect, but we'll work through it. I know some people say, preacher, just shut your mouth. You're single. You don't have the first clue about marriage. I'm just telling you from my observations, people that ended up being married 50, 60 years, they worked through a lot. They realized that marriage takes a lot of work. Long-suffering. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does within the life of a Christian, he ends up putting in your heart, don't give up. And I told you when I preached that message, I said the Apostle Paul, when he went out trying to start churches, what did he do? Get a big reception? Oh, the Apostle Paul's here. He's going to start a church. No, time after time, the Apostle Paul got beat down. You can read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It said five times he got beat with a whip. Three times he got beat with rods. One time he ended up getting stoned. He got shipwrecked time and time again. Did he give up? No. Why didn't he give up? Why? Why? Because the Spirit of God was in his heart. And the Spirit of God says, No, Paul, don't give up. It wasn't that the Apostle Paul was a hard head. It was that when you are under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you are not allowed to give up. Which leads me, I know that I kind of do this as a review, which leads me to the fifth characteristic or fruit of the Holy Spirit. What does it say? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, yes. gentleness. Let me ask you a question. Are you becoming more gentle? I think back three years ago, my, my dad is, has done an incredible job with my mom. Um, I don't know if I should always talk about some of these things. I know that I talk a lot about my, my parents, of course. I know that your parents do, too. mean a lot to you. 
I admire my mom's courage. She's been um, taking now for over a year lactulose. That doesn't mean anything. Any of y'all ever prepped for a colonoscopy? Any of y'all ever done that? They give you that medicine and, and what it does to you, that's actually worse than the procedure itself, isn't it? Because when you get that stuff in your system, it violently empties everything inside of you. My mom basically preps for a colonoscopy three times a day, seven days a week. She has been doing it now since a year ago in April. And I will tell you what, that stuff works violently. Mom, I don't mean to make you feel uncomfortable that you should watch this video, but you can sit with her at the house after she's taken that stuff. And I mean, I think you could hear her stomach roaring and rumbling from the other end of the house. You say, why does she have to take it? And we don't know if it was the chemo or if it was maybe the disease that she has. Something got affected with her liver so that her liver does not filter out ammonia. Your body has ammonia that it has to get rid of. And if the ammonia isn't gotten rid of, it can cause severe confusion, which is what we noticed a year ago in April. My mom was just kind of walking around with a dazed look on her face, and she didn't know her name, and she didn't know us and whatnot. And so they did the blood work, and they found out that her ammonia level was really too high. And they said, the only way that we know to do it is to give her this stuff, and somehow that ammonia will bond to this chemical that's in the medicine, and she can flush it out of her body that way. So that's why she's taking it. Some people are on this stuff for years. Well, as I said, I've got a lot of respect for my mom. There have been a number of other things that my mom's gone through. But one of the ones that she went through shortly after she was diagnosed with the cancer, they gave her a certain type of, of a chemotherapy drug up there that her lips and everything just got really swollen and red and sore. They were breaking open. And I hated to see my mom in that condition. And um, those of you that remember three years ago, we thought that we were going to lose my mom. And so I spent as much time as I could with my mom. And um, she was there in the bed one day and this is something that I'd never done before. But she had all of this scabby, crusty stuff on these on her lips. They were all swollen and sore and stuff like that. And so I went over to her and I says, Mom, can I help you in getting some of that stuff? Because you know how it feels when you get all this stuff on your lips. And so I just very gently started working on peeling off parts of it that were dead and that were needing to come off and whatnot. And my mom ended up making the comment. She said, I really appreciate you doing that for me, Tim, because you're, you're not as rough as what your dad is. <laughs> and I know it's a long kind of illustration. And by the way, my dad has done an incredible job with my mom. He really is. I, I sing my dad's praises too because um, he's taken on all sorts of responsibilities there at the house, whether it's the washing of clothes or the cooking, and these were sort of things that mom even dealt with. Mom was the one that even took care of the banking and that sort of stuff, and my dad is dealing with that and the insurance companies, and plus in the meantime, they're helping to raise my sister's Wyatt at the end of this month, he's gonna turn 11. We've got an awful lot going on. But I'm just saying that the gentleness, my mom really appreciated it. I think about my mom's sister, my Aunt Kate that died two years ago on Valentine's Day. The last time we were down there seeing my aunt, my aunt was there at the house, but she needed to have the home health people come in. And my aunt had told my mom, said, there's this one lady that comes in, she's a black lady, said that she comes in and she's the one that helps me take a bath. And she says, I always look forward to this lady coming in because she's gentle. And I'm reminded us about both of these stories that the Holy Spirit wants to work within our lives to teach us how to deal with people gently. I know that Tim was apologizing for the service that he had to apologize to his little, she five now, 
four. She's still four. Little four-year-old granddaughter. He said, because I'm edgy. And he says, I ended up kind of snapping at her yesterday. And he says, I felt bad about it. He sees in the life of this little girl who doesn't want to come across as being unloving. He doesn't want to use an excuse. And I want to tell you, folks, because the Holy Spirit is living within your life, the Holy Spirit should be working in you to help you to be gentle in the way that you speak with people, in the way that you deal with people. Diane. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, don't. A couple weeks ago, I had a patient in the hospital, an elder gentleman, very sick. He had a lot of respiratory issues, severe. And he was my patient, and he told me he wanted to change his clothes status to a DNR and not to do anything else except what they were doing right now. So I spoke with this man, and it's a little touchy subject because of religion anymore in the, as, a, as an employee. And I just asked him if he was good with Jesus Christ. He said, absolutely. He goes, I am completely good. He goes, my spirit's good. I have no fear whatsoever of dying. I've had a great life. My family's in agreement with what I'm doing. And he had the kindest, gentlest personality. People mm -hmm. loved him. Our floor loved him. He was just a gentleman. And he did pass away a couple of weeks later. It even means a lot to the healthcare professionals because they deal with many times people in the hospital that are used to getting answers and service and everything immediately. And, and gentleness is one of those things. This is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit should begin convicting you and I when we are unkind to somebody. The Holy Spirit wants to develop within us a willingness to have feelings of what the other person is going through, that we care about them. What is, what is the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want someone to be kind and understanding to you, then be kind and understanding to them. And the Holy Spirit, we need to praise the Lord that the Holy Spirit is working to make us into gentle people. Oh, I, I don't have time to go through anymore. But let me say to you, the Holy Spirit resides in us. When we come to Jesus Christ and we ask him to forgive us of our sins, Jesus says, I will not only forgive you of your sins, but I am going to send my spirit. The Holy Spirit seals us. You read that in Ephesians chapter 1, I think it is the 13th verse, that we are sealed. That means that we are marked as God's property, that we will always belong to God. Nobody can ever remove us from belonging to God. Uh, Jesus even used the terminology in John I think it's the 10th chapter that nobody can ever come and snatch us out of the Father's hand because we are His. The Holy Spirit not only does that, but the Holy Spirit comes in and He says, let me begin changing you into the likeness of Jesus so that you can be more loving, so that you can be more patient and peaceful, so that you can have more joy so that you can end up learning to be gentle. How many people have ever come to Jesus Christ and Jesus in speaking about this gentleness? How many people have ever come to Jesus Christ in their sin and their brokenness and Jesus looks at them and says, are you kidding me? Look at the mess that you've made of yourself. My, oh my, why did you end up doing it? Why do you think I'd want anything to do with you? Is that the way that Jesus responds? Or does Jesus end up saying, I've been hoping you'd come for a long time because it's actually hurt me more than it's hurt you seeing what you've had happen in your life. It's a gentle response. It's a welcoming response. And Jesus wants his Holy Spirit to begin producing within our lives these characteristics that are characteristics of the God that we serve. As people see God at work in us and through us, they will want the person that we serve. And we can tell them about Jesus. So we come to an invitation time. I don't know if there are decisions you need to make. We had an interesting discussion in Sunday school this morning about altar calls. If people feel led to come to the altar, I want them to come to the altar. Realize at times if the Lord is speaking to you, if you respond outwardly, it can be an encouragement to somebody else. 
My prayer every Sunday morning is, that, Lord, I pray that you will use the message within our lives to change us, that we might become like Jesus. And when we come to the invitation time, it's a time for us to reflect upon our lives. Lord, was there something in this message that I felt like that you were speaking to my heart about? Help me during this time of invitation to do what you're asking me to do. Because my heart's desire above anything else in this world is that I might bring glory and honor to your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for me. Shall we pray? Father, as I take this time to pray, I'm praying that at this invitation time, that you will use it within our lives, whether people come to the altar or not. The most important thing is what happens within their hearts. But Father, if there are our decisions that need to be made, that people end up saying, you know what, I really feel convicted. But there's something that I feel like I need to have a special talk with you about. They could come here to the altar. They could come and talk with me. Or if they even felt so led, they could even while they're standing there singing, say, Lord, I'm hearing you. And I want to be busy doing what you're asking me to do. Please help me. I pray, Father, that the invitation time might never just be kind of a tack on something that we do. This is probably the most serious time of the message as we really contemplate what it is that we need to do in our walk with you. And Father, if there's things that we need to do, help us to get those things done now. For Jesus' sake, have your will in your way. Use this time we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Christian means is that we are surrendered to the Lord and we owe him everything. Are all hearts and minds clear? Anybody have anything you'd like to say? Thank you for being in the Lord's house. If you're able to be with us again tonight, we'd love to have you. Um, we've been going through Jesus' sayings in the Gospel of John telling us the truth. What is the truth? Truth gives us right beliefs right beliefs lead to right actions. So if you're able to make it, please come. All hearts and minds clear?
And let's be dismissed with closing word of prayer. Tim, we rejoice in your decision. Would you end up um, for what the Lord has done for you with regard to morphine? Would you just leave us in a closing prayer? Appreciate that. Dear Holy Father, I want to thank you for everything you've done for each and every one of us. I pray that you will keep us in your will and that your will will be done in our lives. Take away the pride and the things that shouldn't be in our lives so that we can be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.